This is the Norris Group's Real Estate Investor Radio Show, the award-winning show dedicated to thought leaders shaping the real estate industry and local experts revealing their insider tips to succeed in an ever-changing real estate market. Hosted by author, investor, and hard money lender, Bruce Norris. Hi, thank you for joining us. My name is Bruce Norris, and today our special guest is Jay DeSima. Jay is a, a very experienced investor with nearly 50 years of experience. Since 1977, he has specialized in fixing up ugly houses and small apartment buildings. Jay is also a successful career changer, having worked for over 20 years for the telephone company before switching to full-time real estate investing in 1979. Today, Jay spends the majority of his time managing and overseeing his investment houses and training others who wish to pursue this lucrative profession. Jay has authored three best-selling how-to books published by McGraw-Hill. Investing in Fixer Uppers was voted number one real estate book in 2003 by the LA Times and Chicago Sun. Start Small, Profit Big in Real Estate advises readers how to develop a two-year plan for building wealth starting from scratch and create enough cash flow to quit their job. And Goldmine Houses teaches readers how small apartments and multiple houses called colonies can speed up wealth uh, process and uh, get to the finish line in a in quicker fashion. So, Jay, we welcome you to our show. And we've never talked on the radio, so I'm excited. Okay, Bruce, I, I certainly appreciate you uh, having me on, and um, thank you. And... Um, uh, everything is uh, is uh, fine here, and uh, so we'll we'll commence here. Okay. And, uh, see what. Now you had to you had a career doing something completely different. So, what about you know the mid seventies got you interested in real estate? Well, uh, I, you know, um, I moved to Redding, which is in Northern California. Um, Poor people country, not not the Bay Area. That's 250 miles south. So big difference, huge difference. Um, the um, I had been investing before that, uh, Bruce, in Sacramento before 77. 77 is when I moved, and it was about uh, actually in 77 I um, started moving directly into the multiple units. Uh, I saw a way to benefit a great deal more with those, but I had investing had been investing even 20 years before that in Sacramento, California, uh, and uh, one at a time, mostly buying REO houses. Um, and as you know, a person, even though I had a, a real good job with the phone company, uh, the uh, the fact is uh, the phone company isn't known for overpaying. So as a result of that, uh, you you never build up a lot of money. And uh, so buying REOs for small down payments, um, that's, that's the uh, game I played for a long time. And then, uh, you know, I, it dawned on me, I don't know why it took so long, but it dawned on me one time that when you – pay minimum down, very little down, um, then you have a rather large debt service, a rather large monthly nut to crack, and there's hardly any um, cash flow left at the end of the rainbow there. So you fix them up, you rent them, you become a landlord, and you almost do that for nothing. So you, you have to have a really a strong love affair to pursue that course. Uh, that was kind of my start in Sacramento, but I, you know, I've been a, I've had the fire in the belly for real estate since since my twenties, and um, as you well know, anybody that sees my picture will think I have distanced myself from that age bracket <laughs> now. Well, I tell you what, uh, when I we we got to speak for probably about an hour a few nights ago, and that was a lot of fun. And uh, it was. I enjoyed that. Yeah, and you are you're young, a lot younger than your age, I, and that's pretty exciting. That's pretty cool. So REOs, you know, I I honestly, since I I'm a chart guy, I I was thinking 
REOs were initiated, you know, in the in early '80s. But you found them. Uh, you found them in the '50s or the '60s. They might have called them something different. You know, they're bank takebacks. Yeah. If you were sure bank, you know, somebody did. You know, somebody let a house run down, didn't make mortgage payments. The bank took them back. Um, and uh, yeah, oh well, yeah, in the fifties. Uh, well, uh, I'll put it this way: in the sixties, in the sixties. Okay. Most sixties and early seventies. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Did you were there? And I go ahead. I'm one at one at a time. I would buy. I'd buy one at a time. And I would, uh, you know, the term moonlight, don't you? Sure. Did a little <laughs> bit of that. Yeah, we just about everybody, you know, has done that uh, reaches a point where, you know, kind of where both at uh, has has uh, knowledge of what moonlighting means. Um, I, you know, I hardly know anyone successful in real estate, Bruce, who started out with a bag full of money. Money is not, uh, you know, you believe you need money to get going, but really you don't. You need knowledge to get going. Well, you mentioned the fire in the belly. So describe, do you do you know why you had that? I just, uh, you know, I, I look back, uh, even uh, sometimes I, I'll say this in a book, that even as a paper boy, now, what are you? You're probably 11 years old delivering papers, right? right? Right. That's about the age. They don't even have them anymore, but I did it. And in the hot summer months in Reading, it gets 118. And I'm out delivering papers at 3 in the afternoon. I'm just a kid, of course, on a bicycle with 100 papers in a bag, throwing them at the porch. There must be, in my mind, there must be some way that I could earn a few bucks <laughs> without being out in this mess <laughs> and, and doing this. And then my mother would get me up on a rainy day. It was already, uh, uh, you know, th three in the afternoon. You know, the sun never came out and it was storming and redding and freezing. And that was the winter time, and uh, there, there seemed to me there had to be a better way. Um, and so uh, real estate, you know, I knew a couple of people that owned real estate, and uh, they had rentals, and they collected rents. And I just thought, well, you know, that might be some some way to, to do it. Now, before I got into that thinking mode, though, I was always in love with the mountains and the foothills and the pines and the trees. So my first venture into real estate in my 20s was to buy vacant land in the hills surrounding uh, Redding here. I was raised around Redding, but I left. That's how I ended up coming back after I spent time in the Army uh, in lighting in Sacramento and then eventually working my way back, but I was raised in Reading. Okay. So these these foothills, they, I love being up in the mountains. So I pictured my, well, you know, I heard about people who bought 40 acres and made, for, uh, you know, four tens out of it, sold a couple 10-acre parcels, um, and uh, paid for the whole 40, and then the profit was in the next two. So I thought, well, now that's got to be a pretty good little deal there. And so I played with that for a while. Pictured, uh, I even built a little uh, you know, mountain cabin on one of them. And, and, you know, I sold them and I did exactly that. Um, uh, sell them on contracts, not transfer, you know, 500 down. And, you know, I had the deed still in my name and wouldn't transfer, to, you know, till I had put a little money okay. on the principal, but monthly payments. And, and I thought that one might be a nice little gig. And then, uh, then I began to study real estate. I was always interested in the real estate. You're asking me why. Uh, I thought, you know, I looked around at people and people that owned real estate although I couldn't prove it and didn't know it, they always seem to dress nicer, uh, have a bigger car, and take more vacations than people that went to work like me. <laughs> uh, it just appeared, you know, I know that this is appearance, but it just seemed like that to me. So I was interested in the real estate and um, 
then eventually I realized that, well, you can sell this. Uh, you know, you're just kind of what they call a dealer doing this. Uh, there's no tax advantages or anything, and there's uh, uh, no write-offs, which we call, you know, mostly depreciation, those kind of things, where the government will help you. So those things are missing in that early plan. And so it evolved into, well, you know, I need to own improved real estate. Okay. And uh, so um, then I started buying uh, properties. And, and the kind of properties I could afford were the rundown type because I sometimes showed up on the doorstep as being the only one to make an offer. And uh, as you well know, uh, being the only one who wants the property, that's that's quite an advantage for a buyer. <laughs> yeah. Now, you have to be able to do something once you get it, or, or you could sink like lead in a fishbowl, you know. So so you, you, you have to be able to. Now, I, I, I had no special training, um, you know. I mean, I was no carpenter, but I was very handy. I, I was handy. Um, I described myself as uh, 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 the type of carpenter that cuts the board three times and that's still too short. But you know what I did? I just kept doing it. Mm -hmm. yeah, I, I, I would not give up on it. And what I did to learn a little bit more about being handy and about fixing things was to go out in the 60s and 70s in the Sacramento when they had great subdivisions being built out there. And uh, I would look at the construction of houses in subdivisions being built at the framing stage where you can see the wires, the pipes, and all this stuff and how they do framing, the you know, doors, windows. I remember uh, in my first fix-up jobs, uh, my bathroom sink, I remember gurgle, 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 gurgle. And I said, well, what in the good Lord is that noise? Mm -hmm. You know, the water won't hardly go down in my bathroom sink. And then I learned, well, you got to have a vent in there. And I found that out, you know, I walked out uh, to a guy, you know, you tell a mechanic out in the field, you got to be careful that the boss don't observe you taking the man's time. But if you can do this kind of sneaky, you know, you, you walk out and you tell a plumber, boy, oh boy, you know, you, you've got to be a genius to do this type of job. Boy, they... They shine up. They'll tell you their whole history. <laughs> so so I, I, I learned, you know, I said, you know, I got to think that Gerd, he says, Gerd goes, he says, well, what do you think's the matter with it? And um, he says, I think what you're missing is, uh, is a vent. I says, a what? Mm -hmm. A vent. Yeah. And he showed me a vent and how it works. Well, that solved the problem right there. Did basically stuff like that with uh, electricity and so forth. So I, I, I got pretty handy. Did you have and, uh, Did you have any you know, early mentors? Uh, I had uh, an old timer named Bill Nickerson, William Nickerson. He was quite famous in the fifties and sixties, writing a book on uh, how I, uh, you know. Converted, or it's not that. See how I how I made something into I, a million dollars, right? Yeah, and it started off with uh, I believe it started off how I turned a thousand dollars into a million, and and then it went to a thousand dollars into two million on revisions of this particular book, and that was a kind of a, a, a sort of a complex. You know, I mean, he explained everything. And had uh, sold a, a million copies of that uh, book with Simon Schuster. He and I became acquainted, and so I would rely on him. I'd call him, and he was very, very nice about helping. And you know, I was I was interested in in the investment in, but we became really good buddies. And you know why? Why? Bill and I both work for the phone company. Ah. So he didn't do the same. I was in construction and he was in marketing, but you know, that was a little tie between us. And, uh, you know, he told me about his high paying job in the depression. He got $3 a day. 
um, and about how he got started with his wife, Lucille. And they didn't know anything either. They're just like me. They started but became very successful, and uh, Bill would tackle a lot of these same issues that I had. And um, uh, there was kind of a cute little story about him. Lucille, his wife, was not five feet tall. She was like four foot ten. Mm-hmm. And Bill, Bill wasn't too big, but they talked about painting. And Lucille would paint the lower part of a wall, <laughs> and then Bill had a ladder and and put the ladder on top of her, the legs uh, straddling her, and he would do to the ceiling over the top of her. <laughs> <laughs> a, a, a combined effort there. But uh, anyway, yeah, he was kind of an early mentor. And then I met a guy who was a broker in real estate, and um, that was in Reading, and he uh, had been an investor. He was one of these smart guys. I didn't realize it, but he would, uh, about every third deal he did, sale he made, um, he would take, you know, a commission and turn it back in and buy a rental, right? Mm -hmm. So, you know, he, he had a bunch of rentals, and he had the old junker type, and uh, so he and I did a lot of ch- chatting back and forth. And he was uh, a guy that if I said the wrong wrong thing or acted like I questioned him, he hung the phone up on me. He just hung up. Uh, he, he, he couldn't take uh, – <laughs> he didn't want to hear any anything out of a smart puppy like me. You know, he and I were about 30 years age difference and. Uh, he wasn't going to take anything off me. So I'd have to call him back and say, geez, I'm sorry. I, you know, I didn't mean it. <laughs> but but I learned a lot from the guy, and particularly in the area of uh, what to buy and what made sense and and, and, and how to kind of buy uh, where you weren't competing with everybody on the block. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. What type of property did that turn out to be? It turned out to be the old, um, most of his stuff was older uh, rentals, uh, and he bought economy rentals, uh, and I finally made studies of this myself, um, uh, lower-end rentals. I mentioned at the outset, Reading is a low-income town, so I made kind of a little study, and uh I uh, felt that I wanted to buy rental houses where 80% of those who rent in my town could afford my houses. And therefore, I felt I'd always have them rented. And that that worked out very well for me. So those were lower income. Those were lower income. So um, that's what we have in Reading. We don't have any big jobs or anything. You know, everybody worked at the mill in the early years. And then the mills all shut down, and they went to service jobs. And, you know, the highest paid job would be the city hall or the forestry or the state of California. Well, those people weren't my customers. But all the other service type people, nurses and, uh, you know, the practical nurse type people, they were all my customers. And so that proved out quite well. And so... um, my strategy uh, evolved around to where it started in Sacramento with the singles. And I remember having 23 houses. I write about this, but I had 23 houses. And if uh, two of them were vacant, I had to feed the whole mess with my telephone paycheck. Mm -hmm. And I said to myself, you know, there's got to be, I must be going a little too, I'm working my tail off, so it's not work. Um, I'm going too fast. I must have missed a chapter somewhere in a book <laughs> because, uh, you know, the, the title said I'd be rich. <laughs> Not yet. <though. laughs> <laughs> and I said, how can you be rich when you have to, you know, feed the property with, with a paycheck working for a living? So anyway, uh, the big mortgages and so forth. And I learned that, well, that's how it is. That's how, that's really how it is. So, I was interested in in the back of my mind, uh, even though I liked my telephone job and the people, I loved working there. I I thought financially in my life I could do better. 
I can, because I was never afraid to work. All I, you, you know, uh, I, I'm just like, uh, I, I'm not afraid to outwork you at all. I, even at the phone company, any overtime, I volunteered. So I'm not afraid. Uh, I would get out there fixing these houses and work till midnight and then go to work the next day, you know, and do the same. Not every day, of course, but, but a lot. And I spent all my vacations and my weekends doing this. So, um, you know, I, I'm not afraid to work, but I, I want to work and make some gains somehow. That's what took me a little time. Okay. Uh, eventually, eventually, I ended up buying small groups of the same kind of houses, small. Uh, my best, my, my, my number one earner on a ratio basis, you know, what I've got into it versus what I t- take out, has been a two-bedroom, one-bath, older house. Because when I buy them in bunches, I get the unit price down cheaper. Uh, kind of like buying bananas, you know, and yet uh, rents are governed, you know, by the market. Mm-hmm. So if you've got a nice place that people want with a little yard around it and some fences or something, uh, the fact that you have six houses, maybe th- up a little driveway, three on one side or three on the other, I could get those cheaper, and then, but I could uh, uh, fix them up and rent them out at the full retail price for houses of that size, right? Mm-hmm. So that built in uh, uh, some money there, and I found that when you get them run down and you get tenants that are giving an owner trouble or something like that, and you're able to handle that situation, then you can get them even cheaper, even cheaper. Um, and so by getting that purchase price down, uh, and being able to get terms, and then there was another key, I I didn't realize this in the early years, there was another key item that fell into place here for me, and that was, uh, no bank will loan money on these older junk houses over four units. Uh All the bank forms are designed for one to four, as you well know, Fannie Mae, the whole bunch. So you can't get any financing from a bank. As a matter of fact, you walk into the bank trying to borrow on some of my houses, the banker will throw up. But um, the thing is, (laughs) what does that do? That forces a person who is selling to carry paper. Now, that opened up a whole new ball game for me. And um, so some of these things, you know, I didn't know them in the, in the beginning. It takes time to learn this. and uh, But that's that was kind of my, my progress up to them. And, and apartments fall into the same category. Somebody says, well, why don't you just buy uh, apartment buildings? I'll tell you why I don't. Because I'm buying for my customer. Very. It's kind of like a lady that runs a dress shop. She knows that the people in her town like red. So she brings in red dresses. She'd be a fool to bring in blue ones. Well, young people who I rent to and seniors, those are my people. People in the middle who are buying homes. Those are not my customers, Bruce. Okay. Those are people buying, you know, my business is a rental business. Jay, I want you to hold hold that thought. We're going to end our first segment, and I want to come back to that because you've brought up a great uh, great point about why you don't concentrate on apartments. So thanks for joining us, Jay, and uh, we'll get right back to the subject in our next segment. For more information on hard money loans and upcoming events with the Norris Group, check out thenorrisgroup.com. For information on passive investing with trust deeds, visit tngtrustdeeds.com. 